Maybe I'm weird. This all sounded fun. I'd just gotten married. Oh. <laughs> Science sisters, they're here to talk. It's like not a great place to be a goat. Oh my God. That's that a very, very weird story. What if we ran into someone? We would freak them out. Yeah, it's really suspicious. Oh, yeah, you were like kind of scary looking, I think. Science sisters, let's start the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Science Sisters. I'm your host Iris van Zelst and today I'm joined by Laura Lark who is an actual kind of sort of astronaut and we are going to be talking about why that is the case. Laura, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, you participated in the High Seas Program, which I looked up and apparently stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. Could you explain to us what that means? So the idea behind the project is that when humans start to participate in long duration, long distance space travel, um, especially very far from Earth, uh, this will come with particular challenges. So this sort of environment is described as ICE. So it's isolated, confined, and extreme. And so it's important when we send people, say, to Mars, that once they get there, they're healthy and productive and work together well in a team. And in similar situations on Earth, this is sometimes not the case. Um, and so it's important to learn how, how do you help a team be that way, especially when they're beyond the reach of immediate communication with Earth. So the Hawaii based exploration analog and simulation uh, runs sort of long duration. So long duration in the analog world to simulate psychologically uh, the surface part of a Mars mission. So there's a hab up halfway up Mauna Loa um, in Hawaii where crews of six people stay for four to 12 months. And our mission was eight months. That is quite long indeed. So well, I guess it's a very isolated place. <laughs> It is very isolated, but the isolation is not, to some extent, yes, it's isolation from your neighbors, but a really important part of um, the simulated isolation was the communication delay with Earth. Right. So, so how long is that? It's um, in our simulation, it was 20 minutes round or 20 minutes each way. Um, so the actual communication lag Earth to Mars would be somewhere between four and 24 minutes, depending on where the planets are, of course. But the surface stay would probably be when Mars is farthest, because you'd rather travel when it's closest. And so that's why 20 minutes was picked. Quite yeah. Long. So it's isolation from the informational support, the emotional support, the the ability to have a real-time conversation, which really changes the way that you can communicate your needs, get the information that you want. So it's a, it's a real, that was a real challenging part of it. And an thing that's important to figure out before the environment is extreme in addition to isolated and confined. So so just going back to the beginning, like how did you get involved in this in the first place? Well, I learned about it from a friend who thought it was cool and sent me a link. This was many years. This was, I think, during the first mission. I was part of the fifth. So it was many years before I actually joined. But learning about high seas is what got the concept of analog missions on my radar. So there are all kinds of analogs over the world. Some are too weak. They, you know, maybe they're trying out some technology. There's the underwater analog that um, sometimes the astronauts train at. And then there are sometimes these long duration analogs. And at the time, I think high seas was, it was the only, or maybe the only in the US or something that was doing long duration, you know, like many months. There's also, there's one at NASA that does longish duration, you know, one or two months with different kinds of parameters. But yeah. So then once I had heard about analog missions, it sounded really fun. It sounded challenging in a nice, in a wonderful mix of ways. Like it would be intellectually challenging because I would get to learn all kinds of new things. It would be physically challenging. Um, because I don't know, we got to go like climb around lava tubes in a spacesuit and learn how to fix things or whatever. It would be emotionally challenging. Like it would just be, anyway, maybe I'm weird. This all sounded fun. Since I heard about it, I wanted to participate in one. And then at some point I noticed that high seas put out a call for applications. So I applied. So what did you need to do to apply? They just send a letter with like, I'm ready to be emotionally challenged. <laughs> 
<laughs> there was okay there was some kind of initial application and then once they selected the first pool there were there was a long set of screening questions so all kinds of um of I think standard psychological questionnaires. And then there was another down selection and there was a kind of asynchronous interview and recorded answers to several questions. And then from that, they picked. Could anyone apply? Like, did you have to have a, a certain background in engineering or? I think you they you had to meet the basic requirements at, I think they've changed since then, but at the time you had to meet the same requirements as to apply to be an astronaut. Oh, okay. So that is pretty um, intense. You know, you had to have either a bachelor's and some number of years work experience in uh, in STEM or yeah, um, in science or engineering or medicine or something and or you had to have a PhD or something like that makes sense so so since it was very much about building a team and uh, surviving for eight months as a team did they also like screen whether you got along with people beforehand or was it just you don't know each other at all and now you are a team and this is how it's going to be like did they put us together and see if we got along before they chose exactly yeah they did not for our mission, but I believe that was part of the process for previous missions. Okay. I mean, it makes sense to also change that up and see how, how different that would be. Did you all get along in the end? Okay, good. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise it would have been a long eight months. <laughs> well, I think that we were, we were all very committed to the mission and Part of that is being committed to each other and to getting along. Mm -hmm. And so because we came at it with the attitude of we have already made a decision to get along. And so we will put in the effort and have the empathy that is necessary. Then it was more a matter of uh, doing the work than the personalities clicking. So team is assembled. You are going to, you know, your 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 little space hub on, on Mars, but actually Hawaii. But, but that means that for eight months you won't see your friends and family you I guess had to quit your normal job because uh, that's difficult to do while you're on Mars so did didn't that scare you was that difficult was it easy to accommodate that it was definitely difficult uh, I'd, I'd just gotten married <laughs> <laughs> my poor husband I mean we got married right around the time that the applications were due. So, you know, it, we, I didn't think it would actually happen when I put in the application. Um, but then, you know, here I am. I think that at the time it was, it was not a bad time to be leaving my job for something new. I enjoyed what I was doing, but I'd been there a long time and it was, you know, I wasn't really leaving anybody in the lurch or anything. It happened to be a good moment for it. And I mean, leaving your personal life is always going to be like, of course that's difficult could you know. also yes. communicate with your partner while at uh, mars <laughs> yes communication was not limited in any way it was only delayed so you could just so. you could just talk to uh, just very slowly <laughs> Yes, exactly. So in practice, it was very limiting, but it's not like we, you know, had a certain bandwidth or anything like that. It was just the delay. Oh, so you could also send pictures and videos and stuff. Good. Ah, that that actually that's that, that does sound better. I was imagining you being just like <laughs> on the voice recorder or or just typing for eight months. Yeah. I the thing is in practice, we mostly emailed because there's just not, it's, it's such a small hab. It's not very private. It mm. feels really strange to be recording a video of <laughs> yourself to send when you're sort of in earshot of everybody. And I don't know, it's just, okay. The communication that happens is better than the communication that is, that is rich. You were able to talk to someone, which is great. But apart from, you know, your, your personal emails sometimes, what did you do while you were at the hub? I assume you had some tasks, like what was your daily life like? What did you have to do apart from being a team? Um, so we had various assignments. Well, okay. There were lots of practicalities of daily life that take a long time in an environment with limited resources. So just the, the cooking, cleaning, oh. cleaning the hab, cleaning ourselves, like this all takes a lot of time. And then we had assignments that were part of the simulated mission. So we had geological assignments that we had to carry out and like various practicalities, like please produce an inventory of everything that's in the hab or... 
like this sort of thing where it would be something that people would need to do and it would take time. We also had to do quite a lot for the, for the data collection, for the various psychological experiments or the various yeah. experiments, many of which were focused on the psychology of the situation. Um, so we, there were a lot of surveys that we had to fill out about how we were feeling, how our relationships with the other people in the hab were, how our, how we were relating to people back home or the people externally associated with the mission um, and various activities that we needed to do to produce data on our communication, that sort of thing. We also had a couple hours a day blocked off for exercise. So those were the work days. I Did you also yeah. have weekends? What did you do then? Yeah, we did. We had, we had evenings if you weren't the ones cooking and cleaning and weekends free and or mostly free we we did all sorts of things we tried to have we felt that crew activities were important for our group relationship which yeah that makes sense sounds so like so dry but really all i mean is that we got together and had fun on the weekends yeah <laughs> I don't know. We had a few open mic nights. We did a painting night. We did a Hab Olympics where each person prepared an event and then we all participated. We also, we could request to go out for, for personal reasons too. Like if we just wanted to explore a particular place. And so sometimes we'd do that, you know, and e each person had their own hobbies that they brought with them. I, I knit a sweater. I brought rather fine yarn. I, it needed to be small and take a long time. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. How, how did you find it? How did you like it? What was the best thing about it? The best thing was the exploration, was going out based just on satellite images, mm -hmm. spotting something on the, in the images that we wanted to look at. Oh. And then figuring out how to get there and discovering what it was when we got there. Like even just the textures of the lava, it, this one time I, there was a, a flow that we could see in the images that looked, there was something interesting going on there, but it was across this big ah uh -uh flow, which uh -uh, it, lava tends to either flow in a kind of puddly smooth way or it chunks up and it's just piles of jagged there it's really nasty and it's brittle it's like walking on piles of glass if the glass were fluffy but just as sharp yeah. so it's all you know it's rolling and it's breaking it's really hard to walk on so we had never crossed this flow before because it's such a pain so one day we decided to do it and we got, we all got a lot better at walking on this stuff over the course of the mission. But so a couple of us crossed this flow and reached this, this other lava flow that looked so interesting. It was almost blue. Like it was so shiny. It was iridescent, but I'd never seen a flow like that. And it was really interesting. And then we went over to this one region where we're, there were these big lava tubes and kind of climb down in and see what was up. There was one, we got all the way to the, the flow beyond that, where there were these really big lava tubes and they looked really interesting. And it was sort of like from the entrance, I shined my light in and you couldn't even, I could barely even see because this cavern was so large and I could tell the floor goes down right away and I never got to go in. Oh no. That was it. We had to go back because we're, like, we're on a schedule. We right. request the amount of time, we request the track, and we were able to get there, but we weren't able to spend time. But there were many that I did get to go into and that they were really cool. I just kind of imagined you being within like a few hundred meter radius of your hub, and but you actually went like how far would you go? Um a, probably a couple kilometers. That's Maybe quite far. You, yeah, and that would be a really long day because it was not it was not easy walking, and we were in the suits and kind of had to have everything that we needed like attached to us in the suits. So it was really it was hard to bring enough water. So that that and time were our limiting resources. So tell me more about the suits because they sound very intriguing. <laughs> or janky janky suits. So the they the suits were hazmat suits. So they are lime green and. They had a big portion of the front cut out and replaced with this flexible, clear, clear-ish plastic <laughs> Okay, that was then kind of 
taped on and they also had holes cut where we would install fans for ventilation because they didn't we didn't you know carry a scrubber or something inside with us it was a psychological not a technical simulation so the the only purpose of the suits was to isolate us from the actually earth-like environment and to be inconvenient and cumbersome. So <laughs> they did the job. Oh, there were gloves, um, like rubber gloves, just taped onto the sleeves, um, you know, like thick, thick rubber gloves. And then we, we wore them with hiking boots. Okay, intense. And that, those were just-, just hypothetically. I mean, you said this place is isolated. It's in the middle of nowhere in Hawaii, but I don't know if they've like made sure that the entire perimeter is, is empty, but I can imagine that sometimes people go hiking. Like, did you ever encounter innocent tourists that just freaked out with you in your asthma suit we did imagine a lot what that would be like (laughs) we never did but like there was one day early on when we were out we were trying to measure some features so we were kind of in pairs and it was super foggy and I just kept imagining what if we ran into someone right now you know like we're kind of walking in this organized way above and below a ridge through the fog and these hazmat suits like it's really it we would freak them out yeah it's really <laughs> suspicious we were like kind of scary looking I think um okay. but no it was it, it's way up a road that it's not very trafficked and it's even about two kilometers off of that okay. down a dirt road with a gate at the beginning that says isolation study please don't come here ah, okay well that and help. then yeah. there's nobody really living anywhere near there because it's all fairly fresh lava flows it's also really it's far from the towns it's far from the coast another question do you have any good anecdotes there were a lot of goats and i would have also used the past tense during the simulation basically we found a lot of bones bones yeah all right another time we went out looking for tubes looking for lava tubes and so we found what we were looking for so we go down into the first one and there is a skeleton it's a goat skeleton so we explore around a little bit come out go a little bit further down the lava tube to the next skylight go down in there are two (laughs) goat skeletons hmm interesting and the way that these these excursions work is that we must maintain radio communication with the hab at all times so if there are two of us out signal can't reach into the tube so somebody has to relay from Uh. the top so we kind of would stretch it as far as we could someone would go as far in as they could before losing connection with the hab and the next person would go as far in as they could without losing connection with the relay and if we had enough people we could daisy chain it but in this case it was just the two of us so the next skylight i was the designated person on the rim but the person I was with counted and said there were 12 goats so I don't know what happened to those goats maybe they went in couldn't get out I don't know if like the whole bunch went in at once or the later ones didn't heed the warning but it seems like not a great place to be a goat that is a very very weird story (laughs) I was kind of hoping for something like this but wow did you at some point get crazy I'd say month seven I was you know I'd be ready to go go take a walk eat an apple but no it was okay how was it done with food actually did you did was everything just very um i guess not fresh did you have all the food with you at the moment you started or were there some kind of supplies being delivered every now and again the latter so it was it was all shelf stable and mostly freeze-dried food and there was quite a lot there when we arrived but there were a few um resupplies over the course of the mission with top-ups of whatever we were running out of. I don't know. It wasn't immediate, but complete meal planning was not part of the, I guess, not part of what they were working on figuring out. But nevertheless, in the end, you were craving some actual fresh food. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I mean, we did get to grow some, um, we did get to grow some things however we could. So one of my crewmates was working with a system that actually they use on the space station oh. called Veggie. Um, it might have a, there might be a newer version with a newer name now. At the time it was called Veggie. So he grew uh, lettuce and I think he might have had a tomato plant or two in there. So that is within the space hub? In the hab. Hab short for habitat. Yeah. So he he had that set up under the stairs. I just, I grew stuff as well. Um, it wasn't, you know, part of some ongoing official experiment. I just brought I just wanted to pick up some seeds on my way in. A little bit of fresh stuff is nice to have. It's the small things that do it, right? <laughs> it really is. Oh. It's absolutely the small things. We all kind of 
contributed small things. Okay, important question. Eight months are finally up. The day is there. You're being released. What was that like? What happened? How were you released? How did you feel? So <laughs> on the last day, the local mission team, so the, the PI and the project manager um, and lots of other affiliated people all came out for the end of the mission. There was a debrief week afterwards when we talked to all of the people who were operating the experiments or who were in charge of the experiments. Um, so they all came and they were waiting outside the hab and plenty of our friends and family came too. My husband came and yeah, we just, I don't know, we just lined up and they just unzipped the side and we walked out <laughs> okay. after pretending that it was the wall of a Martian habitat for eight months. We just unzipped it and walked out. Was that very surreal? Yeah. Well, what happened was that instantly the regular world felt normal and the whole mission felt surreal. I came out and I thought it would be a shock, but it wasn't. It was exactly how I remembered it. I and it just, it shifted so that instead it was the past eight months that felt, felt like a dream or something. But it was surprising to me how fast that happened. I think the thing that I was surprised by coming out was that it felt very strange to me to not know where all my crew was. So after knowing like probably, you know, within about three feet where everybody was for eight months, I'm still kind of in the keep track of everybody mode, but suddenly they could be anywhere. And so that was a bit strange, kind of letting go of each other a little. I mean, it's a very powerful thing, I guess, because you're essentially kind of playing pretend for eight months, but doing it like really professionally. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, like in order to get the effects of the situation. <laughs> exactly. But but it's still like not real but obviously it does feel real you know if you have the communication yeah. delays and everything right mm. like the isolation and the confinement are real yeah it's not actually on the yeah <laughs> it's a small detail but it is in hawaii which is like also a, a very cool place to do like the research on the lava and stuff so you know cool so now you know the million dollar question would you do it again i think there are two ways to take that question would i make the same choice if i could go back in time and would i do it a second time i would definitely make the same choice went back in time I'm glad I did it once once is enough you've experienced it would you go for the real deal like actual mark there was a time when I would have said absolutely sign me up as soon as they'll let me I would say a lot in my life has changed since then you know for example I've got two little kids and it would be a very different decision now I mean it's such a ridiculously huge thing and of course this is a this is a decision that the actual astronauts face when they go to the ISS as well as many people in professions that require prolonged absence but yeah it would be a harder decision now. but not a hard no I mean that's not a hard no it's never a good idea to say a hard no to these kind of incredible and, hypothetical things right like come on probably someone says hey you want to go to Mars I promise we've tried the rocket before it'll work <laughs> yeah it's like okay I'll definitely think about it thank you <laughs> could you really say no yeah it's, it's very difficult oh yeah the last last question maybe like how did it shape you and your career in the end? Because when you uh, started doing the analog mission, as far as I know, you were not in planetary sciences and you are in planetary sciences now. So I assume there has been some correlation, but yeah, how, how did it affect your life really in the end? Yeah. Yeah. So when I, before the mission, I was, uh, my background was computer science. I was interested in planetary science, but I didn't really understand where do people study planetary science? Who are the people who get to do that? What kind of jobs do they have? What kind of paths do they have? I hadn't really figured that out, but I was working on it. And then I got this opportunity. That's sort of what actually pulled me away from my job that I enjoyed. And over the course of the mission, partially through the experience and partially by learning from my crewmates, I figured out that earth science, the geology side of planetary science was definitely what I was interested in, that I definitely wanted to make this switch. So when I got back, uh, I applied to grad school for the next year in planetary science in a earth and planetary science department, but in a geology department and went the next year. Okay. Well, thank you so much for telling all this and sharing all this. I found it very interesting. I hope everyone else also found Found it very interesting if you did do a like and subscribe that'll be useful and um yeah there'll be some links below on the high seas project and yeah i will uh, see you in the next episode bye i very much have flashbacks of the martian now you know i think it's part of the regulation on yeah. experimentation on human subjects you can't just be like well something happens too Good bad <laughs>